Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the last behavioral health track of the day. We have the pleasure of having Lisa and Andrea Sakavason virtually presenting on Our Foods Are Healing. Lisa Sakavason is a citizen as of the Passamaquoddy tribe with extensive experience in tribal, state, and federal governments, nonprofits, and philanthropic little philom <laughs> philom <laughs> organizations. I'm sorry. In her capacity as the CEO of Wabanaki Public Health and Fitness, Lisa collaborates with tribal leadership, the WPHW team, and federal and philanthropic partners to address systematic inequities experienced by Wabanaki communities in Maine and to develop and implement culturally based programs that respond to the needs of our communities. Lisa has over 20 years of experiencing addressing equities, inequities of um, experienced by and providing opportunities by tribal populations. Prior to joining WPHW, Lisa served as the director of the Office of Health Equity in Maine Department of Health and Human Services as an epidemiologist in the Infectious Disease Program for the state of Maine, as a nurse epi, um, epi with the North American Indian Center of Boston, and served for two decades as coordinator to the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard's Four Directions Summer Research Program. Lisa holds a BS in biology from the University of Maine, a BS in nursing from the University of Maine, and an MS in health policy and management from the University of Southern Maine. She holds a graduate certificate in nonprofit management and serves on several boards, including Maine Philanthropology. Anthropology um, Center, Planned Parenthood of New England, and the ACLU of Maine and the Maine Development Foundation. Andrea is Penobscot and Passamaquoddy and resides on Indian land, home to the Penobscot Nation. Andrea has expertise in population health and many years working with indigenous communities focused on improving health status through behavior change and indigenous culture. She currently is the Division of Community and Land Wellness for Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, managing nutrition education, obesity prevention, food sovereignty, and security issues, and environmental health. In her previous role, Andrea worked as a youth program manager of a tribal out of school program and was responsible for the administration of the program. Prior to working in indigenous communities, Andrea worked as a health specialist in a corporate wellness program, conducting biometric screenings for heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, while providing health education to help sustain healthy lifestyle practices. Welcome, uh, Lisa and Andrea. The floor is yours. Well, Chief Willowen. Um... Thank you for that introduction. And I appreciate you trying to engage in some of those difficult words that took me a while to know how to say. So I have experience in the um, field of philanthropy. I've sat on a, numerous boards of philanthropic organizations. And um, part of our work and success today and the work that Andrea and I will be talking about is partnerships with both federal and state governments, but also our philanthropic partners. So we're gonna dive right in. Again, my name is Lisa Sakabasin. I am from Madotmagook Indian Township, a Passamaquoddy nation here in Maine. And Andrea, I'm going to let you introduce or have you introduce yourself and then we're going to dive right in and, and share some slides, but also share a video of the land that we're talking about. Great. Willie Walisa, Willie Gizgut, Sita Wen, Andrea Sakabe, Basin, and Dili Wiz, Bunawapske, We, Naga, Beskadamugat Nil, Nujayao, Bunawapske. So good afternoon, everybody. 
I'm happy to be here. My name is Andrea Sakabasin. I am Penobscot and Passamaquoddy and reside on Indian Island. Uh, and as mentioned, I help lead um, the community of land wellness and environmental health as well. And I will pass back to Lisa um, to introduce our video. Thank you, Andrea. So I also wanted to say hi to Jenny. Jenny is a part of our growing team at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. And we're going to start off first welcoming you to Wabanaki territory, welcoming you to what is now called the state of Maine and what Wabanaki people know is their traditional homeland. A part of our work around recovery and healing is very much focused about shortly. So Jenny, if you don't mind showing that video, please. Jenny, we're not seeing the video. You'll need to share your screen. There you are. Hi, Jenny, I don't think we can hear it. If you can start that from the beginning and make sure your sound is on, thank you. And you have to take yourself off mute. There you go. Sorry about that. One other little tidbit is when you share your screen to share that, in the bottom left of that share screen, it there's a checkbox for share sale. We have a property that's close to 50 acres along the sacred Penobscot River. That's our gathering place. It's 40 campsites that are in the woods. So Jenny, we'll have you start it from the beginning. And our people in right. Can you hear this? We can now, yes. Okay, wonderful. We have a property that's close to 50 acres along the sacred Penobscot River. That's our gathering place. It's 40 campsites that are in the woods. Our youth and our people in recovery created a medicine trail where you can walk along and learn about the medicines that you're walking by. We also had our youth involved with building a kayak and canoe rack, and we can take those in the Penobscot River and learn and see the river through an indigenous lens. We have a sweat lodge on the property, as well as a sacred fire pit, a fiddlehead garden, our tobacco plants, and a 70-foot greenhouse that is a part of our food sovereignty effort. We believe that Indigenous people, if they want just to eat food grown by Indigenous people, we can accomplish that. All of this is going on at the Gathering Place, offering people that opportunity to connect to the land, to connect a place, to connect to our territory. It's a place where you can disconnect to those things that don't heal us, that don't serve us, and connect to all the things that do. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing. Um, I hope that the technology works well enough for you to be able to hear how special this territory is for us. We're going to share some slides. If Jenny, you don't mind going right to slideshow. We're going to dig in to all the work that we are engaging in that is focused around food. And Jenny, what you're sharing is not the presentation.
So we'll wait for Jenny to pull the slides up. And we're going to dig right into the first slide. So if you just go on to the next slide, Jenny. These are the nations we work with. The Wabanaki, the people of the Don, the Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet. Those tribes here in Maine are the nations that we work closely with. Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness is a organization that helps to serve all of our nations and indigenous people that now call Maine home. We have indigenous people from all over the country that reside in Maine. They are some of our staff members, some of our people we serve, but certainly here in Wabanaki territory, we want all people to feel welcome and we certainly want our indigenous people here in Wabanaki territory to feel welcome as well. Next slide, please. Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness is an organization that works hard to make everyone visible. We will not turn our backs on any of our people. And in order to do that, we have to build a organization that is responsive. We say every single day, wherever you are on your journey, we have a place for you. If that means you need recovery and healing supports, we've got you. If that means you need a space to plant your garden, we got you there too. If you don't have enough food to feed your families, we wanna be responsive to those needs too. So if you go on to the next slide, what you're going to see are some of the reasons why we do this work. At Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, we are well aware of the trauma that lives within us as individuals, as well as within our communities. Understanding the impacts of historical trauma has been something we are committed to. However, we love to focus in this next space. On the next slide, you're going to hear about our generational strength, strength that all of you in the room know and probably feel yourselves. That power that was held by our ancestors and now is passed to us. And what we know at Wabanaki is that many of our elders, even our young people and others, they know what makes them well. They know those instructions already in order to thrive. And sometimes it's that connection to that knowing that truly provides the opportunity for healing. Next slide, Jenny. So in order to be that responsive organization, in order to be there no matter what, we had to create an infrastructure. And Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, when Andrea first came on board, we're talking less than five people who are on the team. I joined four years ago and made team number seven. And now when we fast forward four years later, this is what we've been able to create. Pulling together indigenous people to dream about what it could look like to return to wellness. We had chief representation and support and their dreaming as well alongside of us. So we now are an organization that has quickly grown to, well, in the fall, soon to be 200 people, 70% indigenous, many tribes represented in that team makeup. When we go on to the next slide, we're going to focus on, yes, what our organization looks like as an organizational chart, making sure our communities are always in the center and leading the way, along with leadership. And making sure that we are staying true to our values 
even as we get really large. We're going to go and focus on the Division of Community and Land Wellness where Andrea leads. So if we go into the next slide, Andrea, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about this important work. Great, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so as mentioned before, I help lead the Division of Community and Land Wellness. So really working in uh, the overarching programs of nutrition and obesity prevention, food sovereignty, food, and food security, as well as environmental health. So really just pro providing these programs within community, uh, working across all generations, and really just taking care of one, uh, the health of the land, uh, including the water. Uh, currently we're struggling with uh, water issues in one of our tribal communities. And so really just making sure we can have that healing um, in the lands. And Jenny, you can go to the next slide. So in talking about our nutrition and obesity prevention programs, um, these are just some of the examples of community events that we do in community. So partnering with um, existing youth programs, working uh, with a youth triathlon, incorporating indigenous components as well. Um, we have lacrosse, so bringing back the creators game, providing that history and knowledge. Uh, but more importantly, just making sure that that we're also weaving in nutrition and how important it is uh, to fuel our bodies uh, just to be able to do that type of work. Uh, next slide. And so also talking about, you know, how are we weaving in nutrition education within our spaces? So here pictured uh, is a teaching kitchen. So we provide nutrition education classes. Um, this is in our one of our recovery homes. So as Lisa mentioned, um, meeting people where they are at on their journey. And so those do include our recovery homes uh, and talking about our traditional foods. So in the top right-hand corner uh, where our registered dietitian is talking about um, the my plate and how that's in relation to the body. So we actually worked and adapted that to be the my Wabanaki plate. So we have culturally specific foods uh, that are relevant to our Wabanaki communities. So really incorporating our traditional foods and all of the programming um, that we do. And next, next slide, Jenny. And so a lot of these are also weaving in uh, some of our, our nutrition education programs with recipes. Uh, and as you can see in the My Wabanaki plate, uh, it's, it's really broken down based off the USDA guidelines of the My plate. In place of the grains, we have wild rice. Um, for the protein, we have wild game. For the vegetables, we have fiddleheads um, and the three sisters, so corns, bean, and squash. And for the fruit, we, we have our indigenous fruits that we have here in Maine. And the next slide. And so along with that education, um, we're really just weaving in that the traditional food. So we provide our communities recipes. So recipes that are in season. And this was part of our National Nutrition Month campaign where we were, were getting out information based on our, our autumn vegetables and various ways that we can utilize them. Next slide. So here's an example of a three sister salad. And for us in our work at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, we don't just want to provide the recipe, we want to involve the process. So we have information or we provide information on how to grow a three sisters garden, the varieties of each plant that you can grow uh, and how to start your own within your own spaces. So next slide. And so with growing our own food, uh, nurturing and healing our bodies, we also, talk about how to preserve our foods. And so when we have an abundance of foods, which you'll see hear that word abundance later on um, in our slides, we want to teach our community members how to preserve that. Uh, so this is an example of how we're preserving that and utilizing these in future recipes. So next slide. And so as mentioned before, uh, it's not just about providing recipes, it, it's about providing the know-how. And so uh, this is an example of fiddlehead, which is one of our traditional foods. And we're always trying to incorporate culture. You'll see culture at the forefront of our work. And that includes our tribal languages respective to each tribal community. So we have fiddleheads, 
um, we incorporate the language in Penobscot, Malice in Passamaquoddy, and uh, Micmac. So you'll see the language woven into the work that we do, as well as information on where, when, and how to harvest. So it's really important for us to talk about these when we're providing that education. So talking about reciprocity. So if we're taking from the earth, uh, providing tobacco as a sacred medicine, uh, saying thank you for that offering, um, as, as well as talking about sustainability. So knowing how much to leave to grow for the next growing year. And then also talking about, you know, where it's seasonal, how to clean and preserve for future use. Thank you, Jenny. And so this slide is just really about the opportunities that we have within community. So it's opportunities for our young people to get out uh, and harvest and pass on that knowledge that was learned. Uh, actually, this is a picture where we're along the Penobscot River um, harvesting fiddleheads. So you can see Lisa picture there um, growing those foods or picking those foods. So also on this for fiddleheads, um, Lisa and I participated in a national cooking show on PBS that will be aired next season. Uh, really just talking about one, this harvest, um, again, how to harvest with reciprocity and how to prepare fiddleheads and a traditional meal. And so I will say that it was amazing to have our youth involved um, in this work. And it was an honor to work with our, our youth and, and see the excitement as they were gathering fiddleheads. Next slide. So you heard me talk about fiddleheads as one of our traditional foods. Um, here is a, a vast array of some of the traditional foods that we have in Wabanaki territory. So you can see that science tells us that we wanna have a colorful plate. So you look at these pictures and you can see all of the color. And this is something that we have been doing for thousands of years. So you can see the foods um, in abundance and you're gonna continue to hear uh, that abundance language as we go through the slides. And Lisa, did you want to add anything here? No, I think, you know, you raise a really important point and that is that, you know, our culture holds the knowledge that we need to be well. And yes, when science does suggest a certain aspect of wellness, oftentimes that indigenous knowledge has been present for a long time. So important acknowledgement. So Willie Wen for mentioning, and I just think this is a beautiful picture. And um, let's go on to the next slide. So in order to have access to these foods, in order to connect to our land, we have had to create an extensive campus as well as an extensive team. And here are some of the places that we have created. We have the gathering place, which we introduced you to, and we're going to talk about the gathering place in a, in a bit. Our Family and Friends Connection Center, which is also located in Millinocket, that will be going through extensive renovations this fall. A place for family and friends to connect to their loved ones in healing services and have a place to stay for lodging, as well as be able to connect to our foods through our garden beds that are located at this property, as well as soon to be a new renovated kitchen for our family and friends when they're connecting to these healing services or connecting to their loved ones accessing. Our healing lodge is not far from these other locations, all based for the most part in Millinocket, Maine. The home, very close, Mount Katahdin. Mount Katahdin is a sacred mountain and a sacred location for indigenous people and has been a place of ceremony for thousands of years and continues to be today. Our healing lodge is for folks that need extra focus attention around substance use disorders and related complications. The Healing Lodge incorporates food into their programming. Andrea and her team are within the Healing Lodge teaching nutrition as well as cooking on a budget or cooking in general. 
really integrating our programs across the board, making sure our youth are connecting to our foods as well as our people in recovery, as well as our elders. The Cedar Way Healing Center is a healing center that will be open in the fall. This is a medication assisted withdrawal center where people who need traditional, what we used to call detox services can come here and get fully, fully evidence-based services to help them with that detoxification process, but also connect them to the nutrition and the recovery supports that are needed. Our Health and Wellness Park Street Service Center is a drop-in center where many people drop in. There's peer-related services, acupuncture, very um, specific recovery services like medication, MAT, and other services. Our community, our culture and community lodging and conference center is located in Bangor, Maine. The last three are actually located in Bangor, Maine. That center is a property that we have partnered with one of our tribes and we're creating a center in Bangor that will be a 25 bed lodging facility as well as a USDA commercial kitchen that will allow us to do so much more with our food programs. It will also allow us to welcome in, yes, indigenous people and non-indigenous people that want to support our work, all of that income going right back into our healing services. So that is our healing campus, a campus that spans from Bangor, Maine to Millinocket, Maine, an area that um, takes you about an hour to travel in between, all sacred Wabanaki territory. So let's go on to the next slide and learn about the work in each of these places of healing. Again, the gathering place, and I'm going to point out for Andrea to mention that beautiful plant in the center, a plant that um, I never saw grow from the ground growing up and developing a new relationship with tobacco has been really a beautiful thing to watch for not just myself and my family, but for the entire community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. So as part of our growing spaces at the gathering place, it was really important for us to start to establish a sacred tobacco garden. So tobacco as our first sacred medicine, uh, it was really important for us to have that teaching garden. So a garden where people can come and connect um, one with, with sacred tobacco, um, with positive interactions, so the youth are learning, the elders are learning, um, tribal members, and really just seeing the difference between how sacred tobacco is harvested uh, versus commercial tobacco, and really just highlighting um, you know, the prevention factors of one education about commercial tobacco, but really highlighting the ceremonial uses that we have for tobacco. Um, so talks about the drying process and how we're utilizing that um, within ceremony. So super excited um, to continue to grow this work. Uh, and actually when this first started, we had one sacred tobacco garden bed. We now have five um, at the Gathering Place property. So still continuing to grow that program. So thank you, Lisa. Yeah, that's great. So let's go into the next slide and see what else is going on at the Gathering Place. And as we talked about tobacco, it's the connection to our sacred medicines that's happening here. Our sacred medicines that, um, yes, come um, through our berries and some of our foods, but also sacred medicines that are used in ceremony. We love the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer and braiding sweetgrass is something that many of us have read and it describes beautifully the connection the profound connection we have as indigenous people to our land, to our mother. And this quote, in some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. That <laughs> struck us. And what also struck us was that during COVID, it was very hard for us to procure some of our sacred medicines. And the team started asking the question, 
why don't we start collecting here? Why don't we start growing here? And Andrea, you are a part of some of that work. Do you wanna talk about it? Yeah, certainly, thank you. And actually, if you go into the next slide, um, we'll, we'll do just that. So this next slide talks about um, securing some of our, our sacred medicine. And you can see in that right-hand picture, um, we're offering tobacco since we're taking from the, from the earth. And the plant that's pictured in the background is pearly everlasting, uh, pearly everlasting, sorry, I was using my main accent there for a second. So pearly everlasting, um, which is our traditional uh, tobacco plant on the Eastern seaboard. So really just working to one, identify that um, and how to harvest, uh, but two, it was also identified along our medicine trail um, at the gathering place. And so if you go on to the next slide, so along our medicine trail, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth um, on the next slide, is we're identifying medicines where we can teach our, our community and tribal members you know, how to harvest, again, how to harvest with reciprocity. So you're gonna hear that reoccurring theme um, and how to utilize those in some sacred medicines. And next slide. So the next slide is gonna talk about uh, some of the sacred medicines on on our medicine trail and really just talking about, about that journey. So as we were going through uh, the gathering place, really taking a, a look at those campsites, noticed a lot of sacred medicines growing. And so one, we wanna talk about um, sustainability of those plants. And so really working to identify those along the trail. And so we have a medicine trail guidebook that we have that talks about um, the medicines that are that are identified along that trail. Uh, what was really important in building this trail was that we incorporated our youth um, as well as the men in our recovery home. So one, they have that connection to each other, they have the connection to the land, and now they have the connection to the medicines, which all brings about um, the healing. And so we're really trying to make sure we have um, that full circle and really bringing each other together or bringing each other together. And that's just what the gathering place does. It's a place of connection, it's a place to come together, and it's a place to connect to culture. So next slide. This is a picture of some of our tribal leaders visiting the gathering place for the first time. This 50 acre sacred property has so much opportunity for us in the future. When we think about 40 campsites where we can welcome youth, like we did just last week for an intertribal youth gathering, where Wabanaki youth from every community gathered, they feel special when they're on this property and hopefully they take those feelings home with them. What is important for us is for our community to know that this healing place is theirs. Not only is it a place that they can come and visit, it's a place that they can come and connect to the sacred medicines on our medicine trail, connect to eagles that are flying in abundance, as well as connect to our food. And here I bring you another quote. The Western culinary diet has never really taken the time to learn this vast amount of botany around us and all these plants that are so giving to us. So if you look at the world through an indigenous lens, you're going to see so much food and medicine and shelter and crafting in just the plant life around you. Sean Sherman, somebody that Andrea works to adapt his recipes often, the sous chef. It is important that we see ourselves in the work. It's important that we're involved as community members, as well as WPHW team members in the work. And that's what we do in all of these spaces. Pull in those who wish to be with us and help facilitate whatever barriers they may have to be with us, to be able to share, share their perspective, share what they need and share their art. And this is a picture of our mobile food pantry and Andrea will talk about that history. But the art that was created here is pretty special. It's a Malisee artist. 
And I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrea. Great, thank you. So um, before I go into the artwork, I'll actually talk about where the vision of our Wabanaki mo mobile food pantry truck came from. So during during COVID, uh, there was a food shortage. And so as Lisa said, we want, we want to be responsive to those uh, issues that come up within our tribal communities. And so pictured here to the right, we have uh, potatoes and apples that were acquired, required or acquired, sorry. Uh, at one point we had 7,000 pounds of potatoes and 2,500 pounds of apples that we delivered to each tribal community. And so it became um, apparent that we didn't have the structure in place to be able to move that amount of food. We were borrowing vehicles. We were being really strategic with staff that are residing and working with us that are in the community uh, to be able to help transport these, the foods to our tribal food pantries. And so this is really where the vision of the mobile food pantry truck came from. Like if we had one vehicle where we could have all of this food, um, where we're not borrowing vehicles, we're not having to utilize staff vehicles, and we can distribute uh, food to the tribal food pantries. And so that's where this vision came from. So yes, COVID um, had a barrier, but it, it also provided um, a vision and that vision came to fruition. And so leading that into the artwork, it was really important for us to talk about um, the traditional foods. So the idea behind our mobile food pantry truck is yes, we wanna provide um, food to fight food security issues, but we also wanna provide uh, nutritious traditional foods. And so the artwork on the truck highlights some of the traditional foods that we want to be uh, distributing in community. So as Lisa said, we worked with a Maliseet artist. Uh, we talked about some of the foods we, we want to uh, distribute and he came up with this beautiful graphic. Uh, so you'll see fiddleheads pictured, um, the three sisters. So you'll see corn, beans, and squash. We have some blueberries uh, and we also have salmon. So really important to highlight our traditional foods and just to give a little bit of history on, on where that vision came from. So thank you. You can go to the next slide, Jenny. So here's an example of what our mobile food pantry truck uh, would look like in community. So if you'll notice in the left, our license plate on our mobile food pantry truck says back way. So you heard me say, we always wanna incorporate um, language within our programming. So back way in the Passamaquoddy language means um, food that is harvested in season. So that could be fruits, that could be vegetables, uh, or it could be wild game. So we wanted to highlight sort of the traditional foods and the vision of where we're going with this mobile food pantry truck. So you'll see um, the various foods that we have provided. And so this is what it would look like in community. So what we want, to, we, what we want is to have it be beautiful in appearance. We want it to have a celebration of food. We want to have it be a place where community members can come to celebrate with us. So have it be a place of connection, a place to connect to culture. So really connecting with the various programs we have within Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, whether it be our nutrition education program, our maternal child health program, where we have a literacy and love program, which partners um, books or indigenous centered books um, with, with parents and youth, really working to build and bridge that literacy gap. So really creating a place of culture and connection, much like the gathering place. Um, so we're really working to reduce the stigma um, surrounding people with food security or having food security issues. We truly believe that um, food is to be celebrated. I was in a meeting earlier today and I told them that Andrea's team and the work that she does puts a smile on everyone's face. And I think that is because of the way we celebrate our culture through food and never assign shame to it. And one of the things we want to change is the experiences that we may have had as children going to food pantries with our parents. It hasn't always been a pleasant experience and we can change that experience and celebrate 
our culture, celebrate our learning through our literacy and love program, as well as celebrating the nutrition and abundance that these foods bring to us. Great, Next thank slide. you. Right, so you heard Lisa talk about our 70 foot hoop house. Uh, so we have a hoop house that's 30 feet wide by 72 feet long. And this is just really the process um, of tilling the ground, measuring out the space um, and incorporating again, our youth and as well as our, our people in recovery. So we had our food sovereignty interns as well as uh, members of the men's recovery home actually came together and helped us construct the hoop house. And so again, really just making sure we're having that place of connection, that place of ownership and the place where they can you know, give back some of the services. Uh, next slide. So inside the hoop house, this is us getting it ready, uh, preparation for the winter at that bottom right. And at the top um, was the variety of vegetables. So we have many varieties. Um, they helped serve people in recovery. And we even utilized some of those traditional foods, as Lisa mentioned, um, in our own meetings and our traditional food programs where, where we're providing um, what a sample meal could look like um, utilizing our traditional foods. Next slide. So those are sort of the foods that were in abundance. This here pictured um, is some indigenous garlic that we were gifted. And so one, we're working on bringing back and revitalizing some of the traditional foods that we have lost over time. So it's really important for us um, to try to bring back, bring back those foods. And so this was garlic that was planted um, last October. It is now ready to harvest now, which I'm super excited about. We'll be utilizing that garlic uh, in some recipes actually tomorrow at an event. So again, putting that theory into practice um, and getting to it, share that celebration and you know, fun times through food. So next slide. So you heard me mention, uh, talk about our food sovereignty interns. So here is a picture of some of the work that our food sovereignty interns have done through community. So this actually happened in the Maliseet community. It was during COVID, trying to find places to connect uh, one with each other, dealing with social isolation, and then two, still connect to culture. So this Requests came from elders to our food sovereignty interns uh, to help out with a community canning class. So this community canning class was held over Zoom. So again, people were having a chance to connect um, over Zoom when we couldn't quite meet in person. And so the request came to the interns to see if they would help harvest dandelion so the community can learn to make dandelion jam. And so our interns went and they were in dandelion fields and they were harvesting those, uh, but it wasn't just about harvesting. We had education about the importance, um, the vitamins and minerals uh, and practicing reciprocity. So taking from the land and offering tobacco. Next slide. Again, our, our food sovereignty interns and the Maliseet community um, helped plant a community garden. So you can see in the picture, they're actually planting the seeds, they're weeding, uh, they're actually picking the plants. And then we also wanted to teach about how to preserve those. So when you have an abundance of food, how are you using that and preserving that for future use? So that'll carry us beyond the growing season. So our food sovereignty interns uh, worked with one of our nutrition educators who's doing some food sovereignty work on how to can their own vegetables. And so at the top right, you can see them measuring out some pickling salt. During this process, the intern stopped right after he was measuring and said to um, Christina, who was working with him at the time, he said, hey, I just realized something. I had a part in the whole life cycle of this bean. I planted the seeds, I watered, I tended the garden, I weeded, I harvested. I've eaten many along the way, and now I'm learning to preserve these for future use. And so he had an aha moment. And you know, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because that's exactly what we're trying to teach. So bringing back that knowledge that they're learning 
and then they can bring that back to community. And so again, highlighting that uh, sustainability piece. And next slide. And so that was some of the work with our food sovereignty interns. Here's some of the work that we've done at our recovery homes. And again, it goes along with meeting people where they're at, which includes our recovery homes. So I built some uh, two raised garden beds and an herb planter at the men's recovery home. So we harvested seaweed to use as a natural soil amendment. So we're not using added chemicals or harmful fertilizers. Um, and we planted vegetables. And so really just having that process of, you know, start to finish growing the plants. And then the men are utilizing uh, the vegetables and the foods within their home and, and cooking with them. So next slide. Yeah, Andrea, with that former slide, what was so amazing is the amount of food that can be grown within those beds and that the men within that recovery home where it serves anywhere from eight to 12 men at any given time, there was more food than they knew what to do with. And they were able to gift that to other people in recovery and other meetings that they were connected to. And the healing that has been described by some of our folks in recovery, as well as our young people, in the act of gardening and growing their own food has been really eye-opening for me. And um, we can't do enough of it from my perspective now. This location we wanna share with you as well. This is the partnership with the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zibayu. This is located in Bangor, Maine on 15 acres along the Kanduskeg Stream, traditional territory of the Penobscot Nation. Beautiful territory, protected territory. We close on this property tomorrow morning. This is going to be a home of both culture and community connections, an opportunity for our people that are living within one of our home communities, if they need to be in Bangor for one of our services or to connect to other services they may need, we have a place for them. We have a lodging place for them. This will be transformed into a beautiful space, just like the other sacred spaces we create. We put a great deal of intention and how we create these spaces. We believe in our recovery homes and our places of medication assisted withdrawal. We believe in our places of other services that everyone deserves beauty and their medicines and their art and their culture all around them. And that's what we do when we transform spaces. We include elders and leaders and young people in the transformation. So we can't wait to be able to open the doors of this sacred space, a space that is traditional territory to us as Wabanaki people and a place where in a ever increasing economy and not increasing wages and in our communities where the struggles are all too real, here's a place where people can come can heal and can connect to their families or other services right in the greater Bangor area. It's also a place to hold learning opportunities. If we go on to the next slide, we're transforming this space into a conference center. This is going to look so different. We love taking pictures of before and after because it is so fun to transform and indigenize so many spaces that greatly need it. Next slide. So this is what we see doing. This big property will have and has four wings. Each of those wings will be named after our nations, the Mi'kmaq, Malasi, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy, those nations creating the beauty within those wings where you go, you stay, and you learn about that nation through the art, through the stories, through all of the things around you. 
we're also offering it as a space to learn, to learn in the kitchen, to bring our youth to this location and learn all those things that both Andrea and her team, as well as elders have to teach. How our culture connects to our foods, how those foods connect to our healing and how they deserve a space like this. Next slide. This is the work we do and we never want to end without talking about that, what people in the field call the continuum of care. And while we understand what they mean, this is what we mean. Wherever you are on your journey, we have a place for you. Making sure we're creating all of those sacred spaces people need. We're not there yet, but we're getting close. Let's go into the next slide. It's important and we think that this number is important for any indigenous person in the state of Maine in Wabanaki territory, or if you find yourself here and you need help, we're gonna be there for you. Like we are for anybody else who calls this line any time of day, any day of week, we've got them. Just like we'd have you or anybody else who finds themselves in our territory. We were able to launch this during COVID and it has been a game changer in our ability to respond and support with everything needed, including food. Next slide. This is important too. One of the things that we were also able to create is the critical incident stress management system. This is an idea that was brought to us by a chief at the Maliseet Nation. What we know is that crisis happens all too much in our communities. The chief from this nation, Chief Sabatis, came to us and said, tragedy hit in our community and hit at a rapid rate where it was hold, it was hard to hold that level of trauma and need. Her nation from across the border came and held them during that time, held them in culture and support and love and ceremony. She said, we need that here for everyone, that when it is too much in community and our community needs deep healing, we need a team that can help provide that. And that's what we do. We've been deployed for many, many reasons when things get difficult, whether it's a, a someone taking their life overdoses within communities, police shootings, murders, when the heaviness is just too heavy for all to hold within the community, let our other nations come in and help hold that. That is a part of how we heal. And this was a critical part of our infrastructure. Next slide. So one of the things we're exploring and we're getting to the end of our time and we really want to hear any questions or comments from all of you. We also love to learn from our friends from across the country. Many of these ideas that we have had are very old ideas and we love those. We are looking at with an organization that has grown so rapidly how do we, what people say sustain, what we say, how do we hold our responsibility that this organization is here for the generations that come after us? And we also believe that the indigenous perspective of how we care from the land, how we care for the land and how the land cares for us is our only way to address this disconnection people have to our land that then is creating climate change disasters everywhere. So we're looking at how do we share these lessons and this beautiful healing campus that we have created in a way that can help sustain this organization for future generations. Next slide, please. 
We believe in sharing that value of collecting those fiddleheads and that reciprocity that happens when you take something from the land. That connection and balance is taught within that process. And teaching those values through visiting our properties is something we're exploring. Next slide, please. That connection and respect for our water is deeply important. Andrea spends much of her time and her team spends much of her time delivering clean water to our elders and to others in our communities that don't have access to it. We believe connecting others to our water, to what our language says, and to our territory in the ways in which we connect is important when we talk about the mitigation of harm that is being done. Next slide. We're learning from others in the hospitality and the hotel industry and those who have done things in such a respectful way that we're exploring what our opportunities are here in order to 100% offer any money earned, offer healing for our people. Next slide. This is done, as many of you know, and probably are involved with in so many areas of this nation. Next slide. And what we know about Mount Katahdin, what we know about the place called Millinocket, a place sacred to all of us as Wabanaki people, is that it is beautiful and offers gifts every time of year. And we have properties and people to offer a warm Wabanaki welcome whenever they may want to come. So one of the really exciting things, I am in Millinocket right now, this mountain is right behind me. Andrea is on her way, as is Jenny. We're welcoming Indigenous people from the country of Greenland, as well as the state of Alaska. Indigenous people coming here to our gathering place to tour and explore, exchange our learning in the area of both cultural tourism, as well as providing healing services to our people. These are the types of things that we can offer now because we have this connection to our land. On to the next slide. We wanted to make sure our slides ended right at, well, it's 4 p.m. here. We're on East Coast Standard Time. I'm not sure about you all. So we're pretty much on time. We wanna open it up. Willie, when this is taken from the gathering place, what we know is our youth feel special in these spaces. What we also know is that they need these spaces in the future to be well. And we are honored to be able to do this work here in Wabanaki territory and um, honored to be with you today. We wish that we were there in Tennessee with you all. And um, if it weren't for this exchange with Greenland and Alaska, we would have been there, but we are with you and ready to take any questions you may have. Jenny, you can take down the slides. Thank you so much, Jenny, for your help. So we are gonna open it up to any questions. Does anybody in the audience? Okay, hold on. I have a few things. I first wanted to say, uh, commend you all on the beautiful job you have done with your mobile food pantry. Um, I just am very impressed at the experience that you've created for your community in terms of um, how people experience uh, receiving services for food insecurity. I mean, it's almost like a little boutique pulls up in your neighborhood. Uh, it's just a beautiful display of uh, beautiful food. So well done. Uh, I, I really wish we could have something like that in our community. I think uh, that would be a wonderful thing. So my other question is um, your um, the phone line that folks can call 24-7. How do you operate that? Great. Um, so I think let's let's talk about the mobile food pantry first, because I think both Andrea and I will have something to say about that. Um, first, I want to say about the mobile food pantry. 
I would love, Andrea would love to connect with any of you all who want to do this in your community, or perhaps you are doing it and have even more ideas for us. We want to hear from you too. But to connect you to the funders that helped us do this is would be our primary goal. Because I think every funder we worked with to help create eight what we created, we did it fast, which is great. And they want to work in other indigenous communities. So those, you know, if you want to learn more, if you want to exchange um, information, we certainly want to connect you to those resources. If you want it in your community and your community needs this level of service, let's make it happen. In terms of, oh, Andrea, please you go and then we'll talk about the line. Sure. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I really like the model um, that we have put together and creating that place where people can just come to connect with each other, whether you need food or not. So it's not about standing in line. We want to create that place where, where people just want to connect with each other, whether they need food um, or not. They could come and grab some indigenous centered books. They can bring their youth. They can bring their elder families. Um, we'll have often partner with our culture, language, and education uh, program. So really connecting language uh, respective to that community, um, connecting youth with elders. So working to bridge that generational gap and then in incorporating our nutrition education programs uh, as well. So really just creating that place where people want to come and gather um, and, and just be with each other. And that in and of itself is healing. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Food should be a celebration. Food should always make us smile. <laughs> That's our point of view. In terms of the line, that was something in terms of how it's run. We did contract with a firm that does those types of response lines, but it's always us answering. So there is a system that we um, pay into, but we always answer. So I, because it's the technology within that system, I am not the person that will be knowledgeable in this area. However, I can connect you with our team that created what we created. It has been amazing. I, you know, people who are on that line, people take, take shifts. So yes, we did add on to the call line. Like, so we have call line people, that's all they do. But also we have people who take shifts that, you know, there are medical director, there are LS, you know, LCSWs, there, you know, they're all of those folks that are trained because we want our community people to get whoever, whoever they get. Everyone has their skills, but everyone has the, you know, the, the minimal, you know, qualifications to be able to engage on that level. But then we have people on call. So then, you know, you make sure that you can address those issues too. Now, if it is a crisis call, um, we do have crisis response and we do, we are able to do that. If it's a medical emergency, then obviously that's a 911 situation and, and we help facilitate that as well. Thank you. Sure thing. Any other questions? I'm gonna take a look on chat to see if we have any. No questions, but there's a couple comments. That is a beautiful statement, very welcoming. If anyone would move towards the traditional native ways of interacting with the planet foods, each other, the world would be moving in a healthier direction as a whole. That's from Yvette. Yeah, I mean, beautiful. I mean, we can't agree more. And I would say there's some funders that agree with that too. And, and that's beautiful that we're seeing this shift in terms of an understanding that indigenous people know how to heal, right? They know what they need. 
And so any work or any support that we can connect you to, we want to be able to do because we do see that shift. We have felt that abundance because of that shift and, and we want to make sure we share that. So absolutely couldn't agree more. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Andrea and Lisa. Um, for this great session. In appreciation of you, Set, we will be sending you a gift. Um, please remember, everybody, um, this is the end of the day. So before you exit the conference today, we'll be, we will have some networking opportunities and our raffle going on for the next 15 minutes. You must be present in person or virtual at the closing session each day to qualify for your raffle prizes. We look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. And please come visit us in Maine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.